This is Richard Walker from Lucidate. Welcome to this explainer on interest rate swaps. In this video, we'll look at the interest rate market. At first, with simple loans and deposits. We'll examine why a chief financial officer at a corporation might want to enter into an interest rate swap to hedge adverse movements in interest rates. We'll explore the motivations of other types of firms, such as asset managers, hedge funds and banks, as well as corporations, for using swap contracts. Finally, we'll conclude with an analysis of a swap contract and show how it acts as a recipe for generating cash flows. Firms borrow money. Here we have a firm, Growth Core, that seeks to borrow $100 million. This might be to fund an acquisition, to expand overseas, or for many other legitimate reasons. The firm believes that with this money now, it can make investments that will yield a sizable return, even after the costs of interest and paying back the loan. The CFO explains the firm's business plan to a commercial bank. Stepping back a little, the commercial bank derives its funding from deposits from its own customers. They place spare cash in a current account for safekeeping for which they earn interest. For most types of current account, the interest they receive will be a variable rate linked to some base rate benchmark. This might be prime, Fed funds, Bank of England base rate, etc., depending on the currency and the specific arrangement. The commercial bank will not usually pay the full benchmark interest rate, but haircut the rate of interest paid. In this example, it's paying its chosen base rate minus 50 basis points. That is to say, the base rate minus half a percent. With these deposits in current accounts, the bank can make loans. It will assess the business rationale for the loan to Growth Core. In this case, it approves the business plan and agrees to loan $100 million for five years. So, as well as paying back the $100 million in five years, Growth Core will be required to make interest payments every six months or twice a year. These will be tied to the base rate plus a premium of 2%. This compensates the bank for assuming the credit risk, of course, Growth Core might default, as well as the liquidity risk. The depositors may want all their money back at the same time. So in this arrangement, the bank stands to make 2.5% over five years on $100 million. From this, it can pay its staff and management. Depositors have a safe place for their excess cash on which they will earn a return, and Growth Corps gets to use the funds to finance its hopefully profitable business expansion. So the commercial bank is hedged. If base rates rise, then sure, it will have to pay out more on deposits, but it will receive more on the loan to Growth Corps. Likewise, if base rates fall, then it will receive lower interest payments from Growth Corps, but this is balanced by the fact that it will pay out less to its depositors. The CFO at Growth Corps, however, is not as sanguine. She's comfortable that at prevailing interest rates, let's say they're 3%, the expanded business will be able to handle the interest payments, which will be $2.5 million every six months. But what if interest rates rise? If base rates rise by 2% from their current levels, then the interest payments would be $7 million a year. And our CFO believes that business expansion would still be justifiable. But if base rates rise by more than 4% above their current levels, then with loan servicing costs of $9 million a year, she thinks that things would start to get a little murky. How can she lock in a rate that allows the loan interest payments to stay in an acceptable range? Well, let's see how an interest rate swap allows her to do this. In order to hedge this interest rate risk, she contacts several investment banks that provide swaps and gets the best quote from Goldman Sachs. As we shall see, a swap agreement is simply a way 
of exchanging a periodic stream of cash flows with a counterparty such as a bank. The swap rate quoted by Goldman Sachs for five years semi-annual on $100 million is 3.5%. What does this mouthful mean? This means that Growth Corps will pay Goldman Sachs 3.5% interest on $100 million every six months for the next five years. That's a total of 10 cash flows twice a year for five years of approximately one and three quarter million dollars. In return, Goldman Sachs will pay the prevailing base rate on $100 million twice a year for the next five years. What does this swap transaction with Goldman Sachs mean for Growth Corp? Well, it means that the CFO has managed to swap a floating rate of interest, the base rate plus 2%, for a fixed rate of interest, which is 5.5% on the $100 million five-year loan. Do you see how? Every six months, Growth Corp pays Goldman Sachs 3.5% on $100 million. This will be about one and three quarter million dollars. In return, it receives the base rate interest payment from Goldman Sachs. It can pass this base rate payment back through to the commercial bank, add on the 2% interest, around £1 million every six months. Thus, the net annual cost to service the loan is $5.5 million fixed. Thus, corporations will often use interest rate swaps to manage the risk in loan obligations or bond issues. Other types of firm find swaps attractive too. Banks themselves will usually have very complex interest rate profiles. They will have a variety of loans, which are assets and deposits, which are liabilities. And all these will be of varying maturities, some overnight, others perhaps extending for many, many decades. Some of these will be tied to fixed rates and others to floating. Given this very complex, ever-changing interest rate profile, it's no surprise that banks seek to hedge interest rate exposures with swaps. Because swaps require very little capital up front, they give global macro hedge funds a way to speculate on movements in interest rates while potentially avoiding the cost of long and short positions in treasuries or gilts. For example, to speculate that the five-year rates will fall in the treasury market, a hedge fund trader must invest cash or borrowed capital to buy a five-year government bond. Instead, the trader could receive fixed in a five-year swap transaction, which will generate a return if rates fall, but does not require significant capital up front. Asset managers may wish to hedge any interest rate risk in their portfolio to offer their investors pure exposure to a specific underlying asset class. Or they may wish to add or remove duration from their portfolio. Thus, there are multiple types of firm that benefit from using interest rate swaps. Some are naturally inclined to pay fixed, others more inclined to pay float. Firms such as hedge funds are equally likely to pay as receive fixed. This diversity of use and motivation makes the interest rate swap market both large and liquid. Historically, a usual benchmark base rate for swaps was LIBOR, or the London Interbank Offered Rate. This was a sampled rate and was not necessarily directly tied to loan transactions in the market and its reputation was consequently soured in the aftermath of the great financial crisis in 2008. Other interest rate benchmarks are becoming common for new swap transactions. In the US, Fed funds and SOFA, the secured overnight financing rate, are common. In the UK, SONIA, or Sterling Overnight Index Average, and in Europe, ESTA, or Euro Short Term Rate, are all rates linked to market transactions and not samples. Swaps can be, and are, written on a wide variety of industry benchmark rates. Let's take a closer look at the mechanics of an interest rate swap. Specifically, let's look at how the swap contract definition decomposes 
into a series of dates. To illustrate this, let's take a couple of examples. First, our five-year semi-annual 100 million US dollar fixed for float US dollar LIBOR swap at three and a half percent. Then we'll look at a slightly more complex example, a two-year quarterly 150 million pound fixed for float Sonia swap at 2.2813%. So first, the five-year semi-annual 100 million US dollar swap at 3.5%. Now that already seems like a mouthful of parameters. Compared to buying 100 shares of Tesla, it is indeed a lot of terms. And as we shall see, there are a few more swap terms to encounter before we're done. But this covers the basics. Our swap will cover a period of five years and exchange payments twice a year. There will thus be 10 cash flow events between the start of this swap and its maturity five years later. Detailing each of these 10 cash flow events will follow the same process. Firstly, we'll determine the date on which we sample the floating rate to get a rate fixing. We'll determine the difference between this sampled rate and the fixed rate of the swap. This will determine the direction of the cash flow. If the floating rate is above the fixed rate at this time, then the floating rate payer will pay the fixed. Clearly, the reverse is true if the fixed rate is above the floating rate. Then calculate the interest payment. This is a straightforward multiplication of three variables. It's the principal, in this particular case, 100 million US dollars, multiplied by the net rate, that's the difference between the fixed rate and the float on the fixing day, multiplied by the interest accrual term, about half a year. Now, this about half a year is where some of the other swap parameters we spoke about earlier are needed. We have to account for a couple of things. Firstly, what happens if any of these dates, like our payment dates and our fixing dates, fall on a weekend or a public holiday? Then we'll need to move them. So a swap needs a holiday calendar to determine which days are business days and which days banks are shut. It also needs a date roll code. This date roll code will determine what happens if a date falls on a day when banks are shut. A common date roll code is modified following. This simply rolls the date forward to the next available business day, unless that would move the date into the next calendar month. If this forward roll would cause the date to be in a new calendar month, then it's instead rolled backwards to the previous business day. Other date roll codes include things like modified preceding or following. In addition, there are different conventions observed in how interest is calculated. Accrual codes like 3360, actual 360 and actual 365 will make a slight difference to how much interest is calculated. Of the three methods presented, actual 360 will always generate the higher payment. So while none of these terms or concepts are especially complicated, they all increase the amount of technical detail in a swap. This can be confusing and off-putting to newcomers. Don't be put off. If you just hold in your head that a swap contract is simply a recipe for generating cash flows, that's to say interest rate fixings, interest accrual and payments happening on specific dates, then you have all you need to know. All the details will fall into place. So to drive this point home, let's look at our second slightly more complicated example, but only slightly more complicated, I promise. If you recall, this is a 150 million pound sterling two year quarterly Sonia swap at 2.2813%. If you are already thinking that a two-year quarterly swap will have eight interest accrual periods, then you're already way ahead of me. 
For LIBOR swaps, like the US dollar swap we looked at previously, it's a convention that the fixing occurs at the beginning of the interest accrual period. However, Sonia swaps calculate an average overnight rate for all business days in an accrual period. This means that the rate won't be fixed until the end, more or less at the time that the payment is made. This extra detail, taking a compound average, is what makes this type of swap a little more complicated than the vanilla LIBOR example used earlier. But as I said, not much more complicated. In both cases, we fix a floating rate. For LIBOR swaps, this means getting a single rate on a fixing date. For overnight index swaps like Sonia, this means calculating a compound average rate from several samples. But once we have our rate fixing, we can determine the net rate, just the difference between our swap rate and this calculated floating rate, and then we calculate the interest payment using the net rate multiplied by the principal multiplied by the accrual term. Yes, we have to apply our interest accrual code for this calculation. And yes, we may have to move around some dates if they occur on a holiday. But this is all very procedural and not overly complex. All this date precision and interest accrual codes might seem unnecessarily precise. How much difference can it really make? Well, actually quite a bit. With notionals in swaps routinely in the hundreds of millions of dollars, then differences in the fifth or sixth decimal place in a calculation can have, do have, a significant impact. This is Richard Walker from Lucidate. Many thanks for watching this primer on interest rate swaps. We began by looking at the interest rate market with its loans and deposits. We looked at the motivation of a corporate treasurer to enter into an interest rate swap. We concluded that many other types of firms, such as asset managers, hedge funds and banks, as well as corporates, are also motivated to use swaps. This diversity of use, coupled with the diversity of firm type, makes for a very big and liquid market. Finally, we looked at taking the contractual definition of a swap. This has several parameters such as fixed rate, floating rate, currency, payment frequency, maturity, date roll codes. We saw how we could use these parameters and derive a set of cash flows between swap counterparties. Please join me in the next video where we will look at swap pricing and risk management.